Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45. It's right there. If you're in 10, that's fine. On the screen, you can see it and read it. But I want us to read this key verse in Leviticus together um, as a church, just to be aware that this is the, the focus of Leviticus, that God is calling His people Israel to be and live holy. So, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44 you see it on the screen or you can have it in your scriptures let's say it together all right for i am the lord your god ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy for i am holy neither shall ye defile yourself with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth for I am the Lord that bringeth you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Hey, just look at the person next to you and tell them, God is a holy God. Can you affirm that this morning? Just tell somebody, God is a holy God. The reason I have you tell one another that is because that is consistently what we're told, not only in the book of Leviticus, but that's what the Word of God tells us. We need to know that God is a holy God. Throughout the Word of God, we find verses like this in Exodus 15, verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in, in, in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? The answer, of course, to that is there is no one like God. He stands alone in His holiness. Or 1 Samuel, in chapter 2, verse 2, which tells us, There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Isaiah 6 tells us a story of Isaiah seeing what is taking place around the throne room in heaven. And there he saw, in verse number 3, uh, the angels flying and saying, um, the one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And so there in the throne room of heaven, continually the attribute of God's holiness is being ascribed to Him. He's being praised for His holiness, His supreme attribute. Holiness. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell, God says, in a high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah, his most favorite um, term or word for God is that we find the Holy One of Israel. He uses it 25 times. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. He was impacted, obviously, by the vision he saw of what the angels were saying around the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Then we come to Revelation. And John had the same revelation of the throne room. And he saw a very similar thing in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. The four beasts, uh, which... Uh, each of them six wings about him, and their eyes full within, and they rest not day or night, saying, this is their continual responsibility, to, to, to declare the holiness of God, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. But friends, the whole Word of God elevates for us this reality that God is a holy God. And sadly, the concept of God's holiness is not something that even people who follow Him or, or say they claim to follow Jesus often give much attention to. How would you describe the holiness of God? How should we as a church understand the holiness of God? If the premise of our holiness is based on the reality that He is holy, I think it's important that we understand God's holiness holiness 
First, God's holiness is, is just is, is purity of substance. I'm mean, just, just purity of substance. Just, there's nothing that is sinful or tainted about God. God is pure in his being. He is absolutely poor, pure in his moral nature. He is completely separate from anything that is wrong or sinful. He's separate. Now, we've often used that connotation of being separate or uh, that which is common. And being holy is, is, is separate from everyday use. And, and I think it's helpful for us to understand that concept of holiness. Growing up, uh, we would go to my grandmother's house in Kansas. She had a beautiful farmhouse, and we would have fun. We would play on the farm. We would do all kinds of things. But there was one room in the farmhouse that was, uh, it was set apart, okay? We could give it the label. It was, it was holy. Um, it had French doors that were closed, um, unless it was Thanksgiving, right? Unless it was the family gathering. And that room, which was, had the nice grandma couch and the, you know, the grandma stuffed chairs and the ottoman and, 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 the, and the, the carpet in there was like, there was not a speck of dirt. Now, again, it was a farm and there was sand and dirt everywhere, but in that room, it was sealed. There was no dirt on the carpet in that room. It was set apart and it was holy. And, and as, a, as a kid, I was not allowed to go out and play in all the common areas and be in the chicken coop and slop the hogs and, and mess around in the farm and all that. I wasn't allowed to do all that and then come right on into that space. Like, Grandma was a kind and wonderful dear lady, but I knew better than to do that. It was set apart and it was pure. It was undefiled in that sense. It wasn't for common use. Now, if we limit our understanding of God's holiness to just the idea of separate, we have not enjoyed the robust character of God's attribute of holiness. We've limited ourselves to one relatively smaller aspect or an aspect of God's holiness, that he's just pure of character or pure in his substance. We need to understand when we think of God's holiness that it's not just, well, it's, a, it's just something that's separated from us who are common and unclean. God's holiness is a holiness of will or his decisions or we could say his actions. The divine will is in absolute harmony with his divine nature. He is holy in nature and he is holy in all of his actions. Everything God does his holiness is not a static or behind a, a, a closed room, no one can get to kind of holiness. His holiness, God's holiness, is active. He actively conforms to his being. All of his actions, all that he does in every way is holy. God, when he expresses himself, expresses holiness. That's who he is. Holiness in energy of his will. But not only that, his holiness doesn't just act. His holiness is self-affirming. It affirms or asserts itself as the highest motive and end. I mean, there's nothing greater or higher than the, than the holiness of God. And he's not ashamed or, or embarrassed to assert and put forward himself as a holy God. I mean, he wasn't, he didn't say, Isaiah, you need to stop referring to me as the holy one of Israel. Right? But, no, he, he was uh, uh, ready and willing and able. God wants his holiness to be affirmed by his creation. God's will and his decisions and actions affirm his holiness, and he is right and just to do that because God in every way is holy. God's holiness means that he is separated from sin, but he's also devoted to seeking his own honor. We need to understand that aspect of God's holiness. He is completely given to seeking his own honor, and that is an aspect of his holiness. We could say it this way. God's holiness is his hidden, concealed glory, but his glory is his holiness revealed. His glory is is his holiness revealed. So I wanted to start this morning with talking to our church about a holy God because the premise of Leviticus is, hey, hey, church, you need to be holy because why? 
because he's holy. Because he's holy. And if we don't grasp in a more fuller understanding, in a more under, a real way, the holiness of God, we're not going to give attention to our pursuit of, of being like him, of holiness. Now, we've come to learn that we are priests. In 1 Peter, in chapter uh, number, number uh, 1 and verse 5, we are called priests. And we focused on this last week and began to look back in Leviticus and understand that that, that a priest is to magnify the holiness of God. A priest's job is to celebrate the holiness of God. And, uh, and so we understand that in Peter, that we see that. As a, as a priest, we are to be set apart unto God. And not only are we to be set apart unto God, we are to be busy serving a holy God in a holy way. A priest gets busy serving according to God's commands. He shows up and the people worship. That's, that's the job uh, of the priest. And in Leviticus chapter 8, we began to see that, that, uh, that Moses sets, set Aaron and his sons aside, set apart to be holy, to serve the Lord. We saw in chapter 9 that not only were they set apart to be holy, but they began to get active in serving God. They began to, to work and offer the sacrifices as the Lord commanded. And the Lord was honored with that. Chapter 9 ends with, with Aaron offering all the sacrifices that he was supposed to offer. He blessed the people. They went into the tabernacle of the Lord. They applied the blood. And the Lord... His holy character being uplifted by the priests who were set apart and through their righteous activity, the Lord showed His glory. The Lord showed Himself. And it says that in chapter 9 of Leviticus that there came a fire, verse 24, there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar and burnt up the offering and the fat. And, and, and when the people saw God's holiness acting in that way, demonstrating value and appreciation to the offering that was offered, they fell on their face before him because they saw for themselves the glory of the Lord or the holiness of God revealed. They saw that and they fell on their faces in an act of worship to the Lord. Now, the question before the house today is what happens if the priests fail to be set apart? What happens if the priests fail in their service to a holy God? Well, let's pay attention to that in Leviticus chapter 10 because that's what the story goes on to tell us. The story goes on to tell us about priests who failed. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Let's pray. Father, as we begin to approach this chapter this morning as a church, understanding that you're holy and that you've called those that serve you and follow you to be holy. Father, I pray that you would help us today to serve you seriously to be mindful that you're a holy God. 
And that as your priests, those who are followers of Christ, who you have called a royal priesthood, Lord, that we might serve you in accordance with your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. What happened in the three verses we just read? So on the same day that the fire came out and consumed the offering, the fire of the Lord came out in a display of His glory and consumed the offering that was on the altar in such a way that all the people saw the glory of the Lord and they began to worship God and they were celebrating on that same day. This the very first day that offerings were ever made on the altar in the tabernacle of God. On the very first day that worship services were held in the tabernacle, where God's glory is there. On that day, there were priests who failed in their duty. They failed in their responsibility to serve God in a holy and a righteous way. And what God did was that same fire that revealed His glory, that same fire came out and consumed the priest. It, not, not that they were burned up completely, because the story goes on to say that Moses called in members of their family who weren't the high priest to carry off the bodies from that area. So, but it so burnt them that in that moment of worship, in front of the congregation, they perished. They died as priests serving the Lord. The main point, then, of the chapter is this, that, that what, what God's priests need to understand, what you and I as, as His priests today, His royal priesthood today, need to understand, is that those who serve God must regard His holiness. And in doing that, we will communicate something that is true about God. So why do you say that's the main point? I want you to look again at verse number 3. I think verse number 3, Moses, after the judgment, Moses is speaking now, and he's explaining for us the big idea. He's giving us the main point of why the judgment fell on the priest and everything that follows after in the chapter. Moses says to Aaron, Hey, Aaron, I want to explain something to you. You're a priest... God is holy. This is what God says. I must be. I will be. I, I can't have anything other than this. If you're going to serve me, this is what's going to be communicated. You're going to have this in your head. You're going to take precautions because of this. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be mindful of this. I must be sanctified in them that come nigh to me. I must be in front of all the people glorified. My holiness should be revealed. They should see that. The people should respond by falling on their face before me. That's the right response. It's a serious thing for a priest to, to do this job because God's holiness needs to be communicated to people who are watching. Moses is reminding Aaron of the importance of God's holiness in front of the people who are watching. Moses' point is, man, listen, the closer a man is to God, the more attention he needs to pay, pay to his own holiness the more attention he needs to pay to the glory of God. The sons of the high priest should have known better than to, to act as presumptuously to offer a strange fire. It's the same idea that, that Israel needed to understand that they were a set-apart people, they were a holy people, and how they lived before the watching world was important because how they lived said something about the God they worshipped. And if they lived as common as every other nation it would say that their God was as common as the gods of every other nation. But God, their God, was not. He's holy. And he wants to affirm his holiness through his people. And so he gives them laws to follow. 
and to obey. This concept about God's judgment upon those who who should know better is the reason why Moses, when leading the people, had this one goal of taking them to the promised land, but on a certain day, he smote a rock instead of speaking to a rock as the Lord commanded, and just something as minor, something as insignificant, just kind of a, a minor detail in the flow of events brought God's judgment upon Moses, and Moses was now, because he didn't Uh, honor God before the people Moses now would not be allowed to go into the promised land God brought judgment because Moses didn't sanctify God before the people he didn't affirm God's glory in front of the people so what we read in Leviticus 10 was fire came out of the holy place and he burnt these guys guys it ought to get our attention reading these verses today It ought to grab us, it ought to shake us, it ought to cause us to pay attention. Why? Because you and I are priests. We are New Testament priests. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and what we look back at Leviticus and say, some priests didn't do it right, and they were judged severely. Priests died. Why? Why did the priests die? Again, because they didn't regard God as holy. And they didn't communicate to a watching uh, nation the glory of God. So, here's what I want us to do in Leviticus chapter 10. I want us to look at what happened in that story and consider how then should we communicate to a watching world? How should believers today demonstrate to a watching world that our God is holy? That's, that's, the, that's the goal. That's what we're trying to accomplish today. That you and I as Christians would understand what it means to serve as priests in such a way that God is sanctified and glorified and that we communicate that to people who are watching. So, how do we communicate God's holiness today? Well, it ought to be a major concern for us. Number one, here's how we do it. First of all, by obeying God's commands. When Christians obey God's commands, we are saying something to the world that God is holy. He said, where do, you, where do you get that in the passage? Well, let's look. This is said in the context of chapter 8 and chapter 9. And it's interesting, in chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Leviticus, before we get to this story in chapter 10, before we get there, there is a pattern. And the pattern is, God is commanded, and Moses, or in chapter 8 it was Moses, in chapter 9 it was Aaron, what God commanded, they did. They did it specifically as the Lord commanded. And this pattern happens 12 times, we are specifically told, that they did as they were commanded. I went through and highlighted. It says in verse number chapter 8, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and in verse number 4, Moses did as the Lord... This is chapter 8, verse 4, Moses did as the Lord commanded. In chapter 5, the end of verse 5, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. In verse number 9 of that same chapter, it ends by saying, as the Lord commanded Moses. In verse number 13, the Lord commanded Moses. In verse number 17, as the Lord commanded Moses. So everything that the Lord commanded Moses, he's obeying, he's doing to the T. uh, Everything that needed to be done to set apart uh, uh, Aaron. In verse number 21, we see the same thing, as the Lord commanded Moses. Uh, We see it all the way through the end of of that chapter in verse 36. So Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. We see that. It's a repetitive phrase. It's happening over and over and over and over. And you stay with me because this is important. In chapter 9, we see the same pattern continuing. Uh, In verse number 5, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do, so that the little glory would appear. And in verse number 7, it ends, as the Lord commanded. In verse number 10, it's as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we see this same pattern. In verse number 21 of chapter 9, Aaron was waving the offering, again, as Moses through the Lord commanded him to do. So we see Moses and Aaron doing what the Lord commands. And what's the end result? The end result is God's glory is manifest. People are worshiping God because they see God as holy. Because why? Moses and Aaron obeyed. 
Moses and Aaron obeyed. Moses and Aaron did what God commanded them to do. You get to chapter 10. How does it begin? And Nadab and Abihu. It doesn't begin this way. And the Lord commanded the sons of Aaron to. It just begins with Nadab and Abihu. They acted. And, and, and you see they acted. They brought strange fire. What's the point? The point is at the very end of verse 1, look at it. You see it. Which he, or God, commanded them what's the last word of verse one not they didn't do what the lord commanded we need to pay particular attention to this friends brothers sisters christians by obeying god's command we communicate god's holiness say well pastor what is this strange fire here i want to make sure i don't do anything strange before the lord i don't want to be like these guys i don't want to be get consumed i don't want to be judged well, the word stranger is rather imprecise. <laughs> you read a different commentary and they'll tell you, you know, a number of different things about what strange fire was. But the word strange in, in other books of the Pentateuch refer to people who were not the priests. They were not of the priestly order. They were strange. They were outsiders. We could say they were foreign. Uh, th this wasn't their role. Uh, and we see that in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers all use the same word, strange. Um, Leviticus 16, verse 12 tells us that the fire was to come from the altar. So the best we can pull it together just in, in the storytelling is that these two priests, instead of taking the coals from where they were supposed to take it, took coals from an outside source. Again, that seems rather insignificant. It seems rather small but to god it wasn't because they weren't following god's what commands they weren't following god they maybe it was more expedient maybe they weren't paying attention um was it a right action they were bringing the incense before the lord just as was commanded earlier in exodus yes it's a right action they were participating in the act of worship they were helping the nation um, understand they were bringing something sweet before the lord but they for whatever reason they didn't follow god's direction in doing it the main point of the text is not to clarify exactly what the strange fire was the main point of the text is to understand that they didn't do it as the lord commanded Moses had warned Aaron earlier in chapter 8 that if you don't do what God commands, the potential is you might die. That that's a real potential. So follow what he says. Now it's interesting as the story continues in verse 4, we reset to this, this pattern of doing what the Lord commands. So continue. Uh, Moses begins to explain that these guys are going to come in and they're going to carry out these guys. And... And they did, verse number 5, as Moses had said. And in verse number 6, look at what Moses says to Aaron uh, and his sons. He says, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And guess what? They did according to the word of Moses. So we have these patterns. They did as the Lord commanded. They did as the Lord commanded. Two guys, Nadab and Abihu, they didn't do as the Lord commanded. They were judged. And then we go right back into this pattern. They did as the Lord commanded. They did as Moses instructed. They go back to this aspect of obeying. When the holiness of God means something to God's people, they obey his commands. So when the Bible says to us today, you know, God says, priests, which we are, our ears should pick up. What did God say? I want to know what God says. God's holiness is at stake if I, his follower, I name the name of Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, but I rather ignore what Jesus says? 
I'm not concerned about that. And there's commands for us that we can obey all the way from Genesis chapter 1. Um, replenish and multiply. It says subdue the earth. I think there's an aspect in which even today New Testament believers going all the way back to the very first direction to all mankind, just as we go about our daily life, you live your life before the Lord. There's an aspect in which you use your brain, you use your hands, you look at the world around you, you learn science, you learn mathematics, you, you learn a trade, you learn an ability, you can forge things, you can do things. I think there's a sense in which if we are people who are industrious and we just serve in this world as men, as humans, as God intends us to do, there's a sense in which just by doing that, we are doing what God has created us to be and do. We're just productive people. I hope that you are a productive person, that, that you kind of wake up with the mor in the morning and you say, you know what, there's a purpose for me today. I, I, God has called me. If I'm going to be a part of this earth, I'm going to populate this earth and I'm going to serve this earth. I'm going I'm to use what he's given me. I'm going to use my brain. And, and, and as we do that, watch this, there's a sense in which just from the beginning of the Bible that we as humans have a purpose just to exist here and that is to bring God glory by what we do throughout the day. That's helpful. Every human can, in that sense, bring glory to God as they participate in the subduing of the earth for his glory. But we get a whole lot more specific when we jump from the Old Testament into the New Testament and we see something like in Matthew 28 where Jesus says directly to Christ followers, right? Go into all the world and make disciples. Ah, we'll do that missions month not a big deal that's for the missionaries to do that's for the pastors to do that's not for me to do wait a second has god said for you to do that is that something we're going to take serious is god's holiness and, and his glory going to be manifest as as you christian get serious about you know some somewhere along my day today i'm going to be speaking to somebody I'm going to be encouraging somebody. I'm going to be teaching somebody all the things that he's commanded so that they too can glorify God. And I'm going to do that. Why? Because God's holy and I'm his priest. And I'm going to be, take serious the things he has commanded. We're going to move from being disobedient. We're going to move to being focused on being obedient. One of the things we're talking about in Sunday school right now is this concept of loving people who are not like us. And I wonder, if, as a Christian, if we're saying, man, I, I'm, just, I'm looking for opportunities to find people who are not like me. Maybe they're a little different from me. But you know what? I'm going to love them as Christ called me to, as Christ instructed me, because his commands are a serious matter, because I'm his priest. And as I obey his commands, people are able to worship the Lord. You know, it's a wonderful thing when people come into the church and they see a church that's, that's like multi-generational. They see old people and young people alike and, and young couples and, 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 and uh, middle-aged people and, and, and single adults. And we, we have a, this, this kind of broad understanding of what a church is. And people come in and say, wow, they, they love people across like generational lines. That's pretty awesome. But what's happening? Well, because somebody in our church is taking serious the command to love other people who aren't just like them, people come in and go, wow, I, I see a church that, that God is obviously doing the work in. Not just generationally, but in every aspect, learning to love other people. So first, we just obeying God's commands. We just communicate to a watching world, God is holy. God is holy. I wonder what commands has God given you that you've kind of relegated taken off the shelf you say you know what i'll let somebody else obey that command but i'm not concerned about that i wonder if you had the opportunity to go back and interview nadab and abihu about some command in burning concerning where you get the coal to offer the incense if they would say you know what we set that rule aside not a good idea christian take note here's another way we can communicate to a watching world that god is a holy god by accepting God's judgment, by accepting God's judgment, we communicate that God is a holy God. Moses said, Aaron, I don't want you to leave the tabernacle. Now, now those are his firstborn and his secondborn sons that just got burned. They're being carried out. You can imagine what's going on inside a dad, inside the high priest. He's broken. And Moses says, 
do not grieve. Don't you do it. Don't grieve, Aaron. Don't rend your garment. Don't uncover your head. Don't bow down. Don't follow that funeral processional. Stay tough. Stay in there. Why? Why couldn't Aaron not participate? And he said, listen, the nation can grieve, but you can't. You can't, priest. You can't. Because if, if, if Aaron were to grieve, he would be saying this. Because the people were watching. How's the priest going to respond? If he were to grieve his son's death, he would say this. God was not fair. God was not just in judging my sons for their disobedience. In the end of chapter 7, Aaron didn't, do, didn't grieve. Aaron obeyed. He stayed in the tabernacle and he continued to do his work. He didn't grieve. Donald Barnhouse, in a sermon titled Men Whom God Struck Dead, preached a message about Nadab and Abihu and how they were killed for offering the strange fire. In that message, he talked about Uzzah, who reached out, you remember, and touched the ark and was struck dead by God, and the story in the New Testament of Ananias and Sapphira, who were killed after lying to God about their offering. And in that message, he points out some interesting things about these three stories that they all have in common. He says, number one, each of these individuals were believers who died. They were all followers of God. Um, they were not in the category of the heathen. Uh, number two, these people were in fellowship with God's family. They, they, were, they were plugged in. They weren't, not, they weren't isolated, but they were plugged in. Number three, they were all engaged in what we would call um, acts of worship and service. They died in acts of worship and service. Uh, number four, they were struck dead for what to us at least seems today trivial, a trivial offense, right? Just steadying the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, um, offering this, using a coal from a different place, um, or as in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, just they were giving to the Lord, but they just didn't come clean with the amount at which they were giving. They said they, they gave all, but they didn't give all. So it seems somewhat trivial, but yet they were all struck dead by God. But Barnhouse points out something that goes beyond that. He says this. He says, in each of these instances, it occurred at a time of important new beginnings for God's people. Here, the very first day of worship in the tabernacle. In Uzzah's case, the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant to its permanent location in the city of Jerusalem. And Ananias and Sapphira at the very beginning of the New Testament church. A, an important new beginning. And Barnhouse says that may explain why the punishments seem to be so severe. There was a new era about to come in. And at the start of these ventures, God was establishing how seriously he considered the purity of the relationship of his people to himself. You know, sometimes today in the New Testament era, we Christians struggle with the reality of God's judgment. We say, well, you know, God is a God of love. We don't like to talk about God's wrath. Sometimes we, you know, people who trust in Jesus want to doubt the concept of God's judgment. We stumble over the idea that, that God would punish somebody, Uzzah, Ananias, and Sapphira, or these guys, the way that he did. Yet, if, if we're stumbling over this, when you get to the book of Revelation, what do you do with Revelation chapter 20, where the dead, the small, and the great stand before God? And if your name's not found in the Lamb's book of life, they're all cast into the lake of fire. What do you do with that, Christian? You know what, you know what people are doing with that? They're saying, that really doesn't happen. Love wins. There's no eternal judgment. God is not a God of judgment. When you take away God's judgment, you diminish God's holiness. God says, I must be sanctified before the people. And when I judge, when I render judgment, I do it justly. I do it in a holy way. God is not wrong in how he handled Nadab and Abihu. I think sometimes God's people struggle with the reality that, you know, a church enacts God's judgment. Like in the example of church discipline, 
boy, I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in Corinthians, but I don't understand church discipline. I don't understand Matthew 18. I don't understand why we have to do it. Well, we're obeying as a church God's command. That demonstrates God's holiness. And God is the one who directed us to, this is how he judges sin, unrepentant sin in a church. So I think as a, as a church, it may be hard. It may be difficult. I'm sure what Aaron did that day was hard and difficult. But he obeyed the Lord. And he said this, God, you are right to do this. I wonder what parents might say to their children when they also judge sin in a just and a righteous way. And when they correct a child. We live in an era today in which kids aren't necessarily corrected as often as they were several years ago, right? But what, if, what if parents today said, you know what? God is holy. And son, daughter, when you sin, you just didn't break mom and dad's advice. You just didn't break mom and dad's feel feelings. You actually sinned against the holiness of God. And the judgment that's going to be rendered to your backside is to help you understand something about God's holiness. Why? Because God says, mom and dad, I must be sanctified. I must be glorified. And if we raise our children the way that our community and the way our society is raising kids by diminishing the holiness of God, saying there is no God, we are not offending God, uh, we don't need to worry about standing before God, then, then parents, before your children, you are failing to be priests that bring God glory. God help us. God help us to teach our children that there is a holy God they must give account to. Well, as we think through this reality, of Nadab and Abihu being this kind of a priest, there's not one of us here who can say, Pastor, I'm not like Nadab and Abihu. They messed up. They didn't obey God. God judged them. They got what was coming. But I don't have to worry about God's wrath. I don't have to worry about God's judgment. Because, Pastor, you know, as a priest before God today, in every way, I continually bring God glory. In every way, I'm always sanctified, set apart, and holy. Um, friend, if, if you're here and you're thinking that you, you've You've just messed up, all right? I hate to break the news to you. The Bible says in Romans, all of us have sinned and come short of God's glory. All of us, Christian, we've all failed to continually obey God in every way. So what do we do? Do we quit? Do we quit being priest? Do we back up and say, uh-oh, I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't serve God in perfection. Uh, I'm more like Nadab and Abihu than I am like Aaron. And, and, and so out of fear, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to serve God. Friends, let me share with you the final way, I think, in which we communicate the glory of God. Not by quitting in His service, but by accepting God's grace. We communicate God is holy. Friends, we still see God's grace abounding all around us today. Because just like Nadab and Abihu, we have all sinned. Daily, there are billions of sins that pile up from mankind. And God's holiness is affronted. Why does God not strike mankind dead? Why does God not judge us for our failures? Well, 2 Peter 3, verse 9, reminds us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but he's long-suffering to us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us to respond to his grace. He gives us time to put our faith in him instead of pursuing our own way. And a holy God withholds his immediate wrath that we deserve. Even better yet, God's wrath has already been spilled. Romans emphasizes this reality of God's wrath. 
It is revealed from heaven, it says. In Romans chapter 2, verse 8, But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath falls. God's wrath comes on us because of our sin. But Romans chapter 5, the story that Paul lays out about God's wrath upon man, tells the story of the work of Jesus Christ. He says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You fail? You fail to set God apart? Our salvation comes not in our perfection. Your salvation doesn't come because you're perfect in every way. Your salvation comes because a perfect Jesus provides for you his perfection. A holy God had to pour his wrath out. And Jesus took that wrath. And if you claim Jesus, you have his perfection. And when God looks at you because you're trusting in Jesus, he doesn't see all your faults, Nadab and Abihu. He sees only Christ's perfection. So there's no wrath from God that's going to come. The story is told of a group of people who are on a wagon train and they're going to the west and across the prairies of Kansas and they crossed a river and continued to travel through the day and off in a distance they saw they saw a forest fire that was just painting the whole horizon and the people there understood that their caravan would not outrun that forest fire the gale force winds were bringing it right in their direction and they were concerned about what they would do to survive that forest fire or that that fire that prairie fire <clears throat> One individual, understanding the nature of fire, he turned around behind them and he, and, he, and he set ablaze the grass of the prairie right behind them. And the people were dumbfounded. They didn't know what he was doing. And soon the fire and the wind just consumed all that they had traveled across and was behind them and the wind was taking it further away from them. And, uh, and then he began to direct the people into the charred path of where the fire had just burned, had just consumed. As the blazes were approaching them, they had no other alternative, uh, but they gathered themselves in the area that was already burned. And the people began to realize what that man understood, and that is a fire cannot burn something twice. For that is a picture of God's wrath. It was poured out on Jesus. And if you get inside Jesus and you accept the fact that Jesus paid for your sins, God's wrath will never touch you. You will be protected. And we display the holiness of God when we accept His grace if you're here and you're trying to prove how holy you are as a priest in other words you might have got saved by grace but now you're just this perfect priest serving holy in every way and you come outside friends God will set you straight we continue by accepting God's grace